Welcome to my channel, I'm Dr. Dana Brems, and if you're new here, I'm a podiatric physician, but today I'm talking about this article that has been making headlines. It's a seven-page research study that was released this week by the Journal of Environmental Science and Technology. They found a precursor to PFAS, a potentially harmful chemical, in about half of the makeup they tested. These PFAS are nicknamed forever chemicals because they do not naturally break down. And the reason people are concerned about this is this chemical has been linked to certain types of cancers, some thyroid conditions, high cholesterol, and various other medical conditions. Before I jump into the video, I wanna give a quick disclaimer. I'm not claiming to be an expert on this topic or a chemist by any means. Obviously, I have a little bit of a background in science, but that's besides the point. I just wanna give a disclaimer that none of this is medical advice and consider it all opinion and do not listen to anything I say for legal reasons, thank you. Basically, ignore everything in this video. But I have put a lot of time and energy into this video. I went ahead and read this entire paper and did some background research of my own. So hit the like button, hit subscribe if you haven't already. I would greatly appreciate it, it helps me a lot. Just to begin, this study, unlike the vast majority of scientific articles, was completely free and easy to find online. Usually you need a subscription to the online journal or you need to pay a fee to view the article. So the fact that I was able to find it so easily and it was just completely free on the publisher's website was amazing. I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested. Just some background on PFAS. PFAS stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances and it refers to different substances like PFOA, PFOS. <laughs> It's a mouthful. So PFAS is actually a class of over 4,000 different molecules and they're characterized by their perfluorinated carbon. So in other words, a fluoride attached to a carbon makes it very hydrophobic or in other words, it really repels water. So that's what PFAS basically is. And they're nothing new. They've been around since the 1950s and they're in a variety of household items like nonstick pans and stain resistant materials like carpet. And the question you might be asking now is why are they in our cosmetics? And the answer is because they are so hydrophobic or they repel water based on their molecular structure, as well as their ability to form a film, they're able to increase product wear, durability, and spreadability. So in other words, they make the cosmetic products last longer and they make them waterproof. So you might find a higher or lower concentration of these chemicals depending on the type of cosmetic. Despite an increasing risk of the health concerns I mentioned earlier, these chemicals are very ubiquitous for almost all Americans. The CDC estimates that about 95% of us have these chemicals in our blood right now. And we're exposed to these chemicals a variety of ways. Like I mentioned earlier, it can be in certain household products, but also oftentimes it is in drinking water. And over time, scientists have gradually lowered the standard of what is an acceptable amount of these chemicals to have in our drinking water. So most recently, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, has said that the safe limit is 0.07 micrograms per liter of drinking water, and this was in 2016, and 0.07 micrograms is about 70 nanograms. With all this being said, why do we care about this in our makeup if it stays on the outside of our bodies, right? Well, especially with something near the eyes or the mouth, we can easily ingest these items or they can go into our body through things like our tear ducts or being absorbed through our skin. With all of the background out of the way, let's finally get into this study that was published two days ago. So in this study, researchers bought exactly 231 different cosmetics in US and Canadian stores. Unfortunately, they did not give names of the exact cosmetics they bought, but they did say they purchased from Sephora, Ulta, Target, Bed Bath & Beyond. Then they screened these 231 cosmetic products for total fluorine, not fluoride, fluorine, using particle-induced gamma ray emission. So the takeaway so far is they took 231 cosmetic products and they looked at the total fluorine in them. Out of these 231 products where they just looked at the fluorine in it, 56% of foundations and eye products had fluorine, 48% of lip products, and 47% of mascaras all had fluorine, which is an indicator of PFOS. Foundations had the highest median total of fluorine, while lip products had the highest proportional total fluorine. 
So they looked at this first part of the study. They saw there was a lot of fluorine in the lip products, the mascara, and the foundation. So they moved on to the next part of the study where they selected 29 of these initial 231 products for a targeted analysis of specific PFOS. So again, the first part of the study with the 231 products was just looking at fluorine, and the second part of the study with the 29 products was looking at different types of PFOS specifically. So they looked at 53 different types of PFOS in this second part of the study. And of those 29 tested, all 29 contained a detectable level of at least four PFOS. Specifically, the most frequently detected PFOS were these. So one thing of note is they chose those 29 products out of the original 231 because they were high in fluorine and therefore expected to be high in PFOS. However, interestingly, the PIGE on this table, which remember is the fluorine, and the PFOS was not correlated, meaning there was no relationship between the fluorine and the PFOS seen in the second part of the study. This could mean a couple things. One is that there was a lot of PFOS that was not tested by them. Remember, there are thousands of PFOS and they were looking at 53. Two is the presence of inorganic and polymeric fluorine. And three would be errors in research methods. Importantly, they did note higher fluorine levels for cosmetics that were labeled as waterproof and water resistant, as well as long lasting, both in mascaras, lipsticks, and even foundations. Unfortunately, they didn't give specifics about what products exactly these were that were tested, but they said that the majority of these products did not disclose any fluorinated compounds in their label list. Uh, so this really exposes a gap between both the U.S. and the Canadian label laws for cosmetics. So after laying out the results of PFOS in the makeup products themselves and the direct exposure from putting them on your face, this study did also mention the possible environmental effect. PFOS and product could contribute to human and ecosystem exposure throughout the life cycle of the product through manufacturing to even product end of life. Because cosmetic use leads to PFOS entering the wastewater streams, leading to accumulation in the environment, which can lead to additional human exposure. And again, this ties back to why PFOS has been in the news the past couple years for being in drinking water. As I mentioned earlier, the most recent update from the EPA was that the safe level of PFOS is 0.07 micrograms per liter, which is 70 nanograms. And this is for ingestion through drinking water. And just for a little comparison's sake, here's the table again of the amount of a particular type of PFOS they found in this study. But again, this isn't the whole picture. Now what? Again, just a personal opinion. I can't help but look at this study and not be too surprised. <laughs> I've also looked at a lot of the media coverage of this study, and I'm also a little bit disappointed. I do think sometimes the data gets a little bit misrepresented to be as sensationalized as possible. And I hope that this story, like many others, People who consume media realize that news stations, even influencers, are financially motivated to get your clicks, to get your ad dollars. So anytime that news comes from a place with an ad on it, just know it's not an unbiased source. But with that out of the way, let me draw some more objective conclusions from this study. <laughs> Number one, I think this brings to light the fact that not everything that's in our cosmetic bottles is on the label, which reveals a need for regulation. But something good that came from this study is the No PFAS in Cosmetic Act was introduced this Tuesday to the House and Senate. So we're working towards better regulation. Point number two, if this article makes you wanna avoid PFAS in your own life, some easy steps you can take is to avoid makeup that says it is waterproof or water resistant or even smudge proof or long lasting, as painful as that is, especially if it's in an area around the eye or the mouth because it's easy to ingest 
And point number three would just be to remove your makeup at night or once you're done wearing it for the day. This minimizes your exposure. And that is it. I will try to change the description if there are any changes to this story or any new news comes out. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching. Please hit that like and subscribe and I'll see you guys next time.